A good story is like an open window. For kids curious about growing up on a farm, Ohio author Michelle Houts draws back the curtains and raises the sash. I remember very clearly our fairs in August and Olivia started to cry in May. Olivia started to be really sad and every night would say, you know, I don't want to sell him, I don't want to sell him. So we'd go through the logical part of it. Is he a market steer or is he a pet? I knew that I couldn't keep that steer forever. And that was tough. That got me a, that got me a little choked up. You just get close to an animal that you take care of for that long and that you spend that much time with. The animals are going to be marketed and, and, and be butchered, and the first one would be the toughest. It was hard to hear my dad say that, but I guess it just kind of taught me a lot about the way things really work. And uh, that's just the way, the way things happen on the farm. I'm Michelle Houts. I'm a writer. I'm a school speech pathologist. I'm a mom, and I'm a farmer. After that first year that Olivia went into the auction ring and showed the steer, and, and I thought this would make a great story, I did decide to sit down and write it. I don't think I really had been to many livestock shows before I met and married my husband. And he made it really clear, we hadn't been dating very long, that if this was going to work out, I was going to be moving to Mercer County because he had farmland. He was going to go home to the family farm. And there was no debate on that. She got used to the idea, and I'm, I'm sure glad that she did. I live on a farm now, and since I write a lot about farming, a lot of people think that I've been here my whole life, but I haven't been. I actually grew up in suburban Columbus in Westerville, Ohio, and um, I had relatives that farmed. So some of my favorite summer memories are visiting my cousin's dairy farm in Coshocton County and kind of pretending to be that farm girl for a week at a time. The Houts children, Seth, Olivia, and Maggie never had to pretend. They were full-time farm kids. When Olivia showed her first steers, it was you know, a learning experience for me as well, not having grown up on the farm. Um, so it was kind of a daddy-daughter project. I was nine, and that was kind of the first thing that I got to do, like just with my dad. I definitely look back and value that time that we spent together taking care of those animals. The kids were walking their steers with their dad around the barnyard, and sure enough, Olivia's steer got spooked. You hang on as long as you can and try to keep from letting them get loose. He jerked one way, and she grabbed tighter, and he jerked the other way, and she grabbed tighter, and her dad's yelling, hold on, hold on, and I'm yelling, let go, let go. <laughs> but I used that in the book when one of the steers was getting loose. They always start Dear Author. Michelle's first two attempts at a children's story resulted in a flurry of rejection letters. But her third effort, The Beef Princess of Practical County, caught the attention of Random House. When I got the call saying that they wanted to publish the manuscript, I was just absolutely thrilled. It was my first book, so it was the first time I had been through that editing process. I was getting uh, what we call editorial letters, which are these wonderful, very lengthy um, letters from your editor <laughs> that make you wonder why, why they bought your manuscript in the first place. But I received an editorial letter, and my editor wanted to discuss the ending. And I always refer back to Charlotte's Web, which is one of my all-time favorite children's books. It's a fantastic book about Wilbur going to the fair. But in the end of Charlotte's Web, you know, Wilbur kind of becomes the family pet. He's saved from his inevitable end, and, and that, that makes a wonderful story. But what was special about the Beef Princess was, I think a lot of people were thinking, somebody's gonna come along and save the steer in the end. As the fair got closer, Olivia continued to be pretty apprehensive about it. It was, is she gonna be able to handle it or not? But she put on her game face, looked at me and said, stay away. I just told her that it was something I needed to do by myself. 
Suddenly the line moved forward. The hind quarters of the stocky shorthorn steer in front of us took a step and so did we, one step closer to the inevitable. Don't listen, don't look, don't think, just go, just go. The tears were actually easier to hold back than the awful urge to stop moving. I just wanted to freeze time at this very second so I could throw my arms around him and squeeze, so I could bury my face in his warm, soft neck and smell the sweet mixture of straw and shampoo, so I could tell him I loved him and I was so proud of him. Olivia and her dad got through it just perfectly. She was ready to pick out her steer and do it again. Right after the fair is when we go pick out next year's animals. And so um, right away, I knew that I was going to do it again. So I think that's part of the reason why I felt Libby in the book needed to be ready and pick out her steer. So my editor said, maybe Libby doesn't sell her steer in the end, or maybe she sells her steer in the end. And then instead of picking out a new steer for next year's fair, she gets a puppy. She didn't get it. She didn't see the big picture. She didn't understand the story that I was trying to tell. But after I calmed down, I had a lovely conversation with her. She was fantastic. And she said, you know, Michelle, your name's on this book, not mine. And so you've got to tell the story that you want to tell. But she said, here's your challenge. I'm sitting here in New York City. I don't have a farm background. And I'm your reader. And I don't understand why, if it breaks Libby's heart to sell this steer, why she go back and do it again the next year? She put that challenge to me and said, you know, now rewrite your story. So... I was then I felt really fortunate to be at the fair because I had at my fingertips all these kids that were showing and then selling their animals and then likely choosing to do it again next year. So then I asked the big question, why? You know, and kids had great answers. They were able to really articulate and tell me why they why they do it, why they are in 4-H, why they're in FFA, why they bring their animals to the fair. And the answer, you know, always came down to, well, this is how we feed the world. Now, Maggie, their youngest child, is discovering the joys and heartaches that farm life delivers. The first time I ever had a market animal, I had a 1,400 pound Holstein steer named Buddy. And I was just, I thought I was in love with him. He was the cutest, most amazing steer. And um, when I had to sell him, I bawled my eyes out. I think Mom's book is definitely a really accurate portrayal of what the farm life is all about. It's not so much the sweet little story. It's, it is hard and it is, is rough and she did a really good job of portraying exactly what that's like and also why that's important. It's something to be proud of, not something to be sad about. And you're putting the food on someone's table <laughs> and that's far more important than saying goodbye to an animal. The Beef Princess did pretty well for Random House. It got the International Reading Association Children's Book of the Year for Intermediate Fiction. They sent me to Chicago to accept the award, and that was really exciting. And I immediately was thinking about a sequel to Beef Princess. That sequel became the Practical County Drama Queen, which was quickly followed by her third children's book, Winter Frost, a story set in Denmark. The farm life that has inspired Michelle has also deeply influenced her children. I love everything about growing up on a farm. I'm so thankful that my parents raised us where they did, how they did, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. I really value everything that I've learned growing up on a farm, and I know that I want to stay close to the farm life. Farm kids have always understood the cycle of life. Generations come and go, and what they leave behind is tradition a way of life, an enduring gift for those who love the land. It's like this, said Granddad. Ryan's Mead was built on tradition. We Ryans love this land and we love the animals we raise on it. That's why they are so well cared for here. This year, you've had your first taste of raising cattle and I can tell it's in your blood. I knew just what he meant. Whether I was in the pasture or with the herd or in the barn with my fair calves, I loved being with the steers. No matter what we choose to do in this life, Libby, we learn to take the bad with the good. Letting go is one of the hard parts, but that's just not part of raising cattle. That's part of life, too. Mm -hmm.